Um, also, I want to let everyone know there will be a reception uh, immediately after this, uh, following in the DRC2 auditorium, where we'll have a chance to mingle with the speakers and talk to the company people a bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael Dixon with Unimed. Uh, Unimed is the technology commercialization and development entity here at UNMC. So our goal is to see technologies uh, that are created in the lab developed into products that help improve healthcare. Um, we really recognize that the technology development is a long, expensive process, and so that's why we created the demo day to try to give you, uh, to give everyone a glimpse at some of the hard work and development that's going into creating the technologies of tomorrow. So it, it's a very tedious process, it's a very expensive process, and I think we've got some companies that are just doing an amazing job developing products. And these are really the, the products of the next generation. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing them develop these technologies further. Uh, so now we're gonna hear about individuals that suffer from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And uh, Dr. Jenna Yentes is here from the UNO Biomechanics Laboratory to tell us about a new platform that uses natural biorhythms in the human system and how they can be used to detect the earliest signs of trouble long before patients notice. So, Jenna, come on up. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, thank you all for coming today. Um, as you mentioned, I'll be talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So I'd like to acknowledge my two pulmonologists that I work closely with um, here at the Med Center, which is Drs. Stephen Renard and Amal Patil. Um, COPD is a disease of the lungs um, that presents itself with airflow limitation um, that's progressive. Um, it eventually leads to narrowing of the airways and uh, essentially destruction of lung tissue. And it's currently listed as the third leading cause of death in the United States, and it's, only, it's the only chronic disease on the rise. Um, you can see a lot of the different um, factors that lead to COPD listed here, like cigarette smoking or um, even genetics, environmental pollutants, those types of things, occupational. Um, after I started studying COPD, it's kind of, I don't know, serendipity, I guess. My father was diagnosed with COPD. He was a firefighter for many years. so. I guess going into fires is uh, one way to get COPD. He was a never smoker, so. But it's not just a disease of the lungs. Um, a lot of people think of COPD as a disease strictly of the lungs, but actually these patients have problems that are systemic. They're everywhere um, outside of the lungs, including the lungs. So um, they present with problems um, that affect every system. And this can be seen in the fact that patients with COPD don't move around a lot. They're, they're very physically inactive. Even those with mild COPD, you put an accelerometer on them and you have them go out and just wear the accelerometer for a week and they come back. Um, they have very um, almost normal lung function and they really don't move around. Um, and in addition to that, they're at a really high risk for falls. A lot of this could be related to the fact that they're suffering from a lot of changes in their skeletal muscle system. The structure and the function of the skeletal muscles has changed quite a bit as due to their disease. This could be also related to the disuse. They're not really sure how that's happening. We're trying to tease that out. But in addition, these patients are more likely to be diagnosed with other problems as well, such as osteoporosis, depression, anxiety, diabetes, and so forth. Um, now, patients with COPD are more than likely going to be um, having times where the disease worsens acutely. Um, maybe they end up having um, increase in symptoms, and this is called an exacerbation. Now, the greatest amount of healthcare costs associated with uh, treating this disease is associated with treating exacerbations. The problem with exacerbations is that there's really no good way to predict that these are going to happen. And in fact, there's really not even a good way to diagnose them. A doctor will have to wait for the patient to let their symptom profile develop completely or fully before they can actually say, yes, you're having an exacerbation. So the patient could come in and they could say, I actually have to wait two or three days to actually say you're having an exacerbation. At this point in time, that patient may actually need to be hospitalized and everything else. So we can see healthcare costs going up as this uh, happens. 
Currently, there's two ways that we try to either predict or identify exacerbations. Prediction is done through healthcare utilization. If you've been to the hospital before for an exacerbation, more than likely you're going to go again. And so that's one way we predict them. Um, the only FDA approved way to diagnose them currently is to use something called exact. Exact is a 14 question survey that the patient fills out daily. And after a couple days, uh, the doctor can look back at the past few days and say, yep, yeah, your disease is getting worse. Okay, I can say that you have an exacerbation. This is truly where we're at with this disease. It's quite sad. So really, there's no good way in real time for us to identify, monitor, predict, diagnose, do any of these things for these patients in real time. So we're looking for solutions to help these patients and to help these physicians. So we approached it from a completely out of the box, um, objective way. Um, I study variability and I thought, you know, biological rhythms and train to each other, walking and breathing, they go together. Whether or not you think about it, when you walk, they'll start to couple to each other. That's what it's called. And it's not voluntary, it's essential, it happens subconsciously. It's not a free choice. You most likely notice it when you run. But it happens with wheelchair progression, or propulsion, excuse me. It happens with crutch walking. Um, it happens in rowing. We see it in so many things and activities that humans do. So movement and breathing and train to one another. Well, our hypothesis then was maybe patients with COPD have a really hard time coupling, walking, and breathing with each other because we know that their breathing is abnormal and we know that their walking is abnormal based on some preliminary studies that we had done. And when I say that they're abnormal, what I'm talking about is rhythms don't actually repeat perfectly over and over. If you look just at um, the picture that we have here, this top row is actually a healthy individual. And then the middle is someone with moderate COPD and the bottom is actually someone with severe. So if you just take your hand, you lay it over your chest, and you kind of quietly monitor your own breathing, you'll notice that your breaths change from breath to breath. They're never quite the same. One may be a little deeper, one may be a little shallower. The timing may be a little different, okay? And that's because you're more than likely a healthy individual and you don't have COPD. But if you notice, once you have COPD, you breathe a little faster, that's why there's more of them here. Respiratory rate goes up, but they look almost identical to each other. They've lost that variability. That rhythm is now abnormal. So we thought that they'd have some difficulty coupling to one another. And how we monitor this in the, in the lab right now is really cumbersome, okay? It takes a lot for us to monitor this when we put people in the lab. Um, a lot of people are familiar with how you monitor metabolic costs. We can do the same way to monitor breathing. We can do it through other monitors and sensors as well. And walking is done through three-dimensional motion capture with these small little reflective markers that you can see here um, on the patient. So they're monitored simultaneously. So really what we're trying to get at is a remote solution that we can deploy into the homes of these individuals to monitor them um, outside of a laboratory. So in a quick pilot study that we did, um, we looked at age match controls in patients with COPD. We had them walk on a treadmill and then at, various, at their own self-selected speed, oh, let's go back, at their own self-selected speed and then at various other speeds um, just to challenge them a little bit. Now this data up here, it's very simple data. It's just telling you what the ranges are of their walking um, steps to breath. So how many steps did they take per breath? Um, we have data on healthy young individuals as well. They'll take anywhere from five to six steps per breath. And as we age, those ranges decrease. But as we get to COPD, those ranges are even more strict. They really like a one-to-one. -one. They like one step per breath. And so we've lost that variability in the sort of ranges or frequency ratios that we can use. This is also another a measure that we can use to look at coupling. This tells us the temporal similarity or the timing in which um, breathing and walking happens. 
Red is COPD and blue are the uh, healthy controls. And the increase just means that the timing is, is uh, more similar, so the timing in which those things are happening. So overall, our data has suggested that they're less variable in their ability to couple, meaning they have a stronger coupling, so actually the opposite of what our hypothesis was. Okay? They're very strict in how they couple. It links up and it stays linked. Okay? And we see this even with di disease progression. So we've come up with a solution um, that we feel that we can deploy into the field to remotely monitor these individuals, okay? So a clinical uh, tool that can be used. All right, this is a device that we have um, devised that can monitor walking and breathing simultaneously in the homes. Um, it's two pieces. One piece goes on the shoe, and another is a strap that goes around the chest, and then it's um, connected to a small little piece that goes on the hip, essentially, or can go into the pocket. This is the user interface that we use in the laboratory when we're testing it to see the device, uh, to see that it's working in real time. But essentially, this is the second version of our prototype. Um, essentially, we want to deploy this out into the field to validate the data that we've already had from our previous findings. We are currently working on trying to commercialize um, a very similar product that will then push these data into a platform um, that can then inform the physician or a healthcare provider when disease worsening is happening, therefore allowing the physician to intervene at an earlier time, and therefore getting the patient care um, before the exacerbation uh, develops fully, so before the full, symptom, uh, full symptoms have developed. So this is essentially the platform that we've been working with, and we've been uh, designing this for a little over one year now. I'd just like to thank all of the folks that work over at the Biomechanics Research Building and also our funding sources. So are there any questions? Yeah. Yes? How many, how, many, uh, how many subjects do you need to get the, the data to give you the ability to predict the, how, how many patients or it's so <laughs> It's a really interesting question. The, uh, COPD presents itself with a lot of heterogeneity, and so it's difficult for us to say at the time. Um, we've been thinking that we could do it with about 100, and so that's where we're starting, and that's where we've been trying to plug away with. And so we're going to try to do it. Um, essentially, we've tried to do, do it with 50 and then sort of validate our model with the other 50, um, and that's where we're going to start with our, our first real clinical pilot. Um, well, since I'm not a pulmonologist, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm sure that they would have an idea. So essentially, um, it could present itself in any way. It's going to be that the disease is, what we're hoping, we're, we're going to capture is either a change in breathing rhythms or a change in walking rhythms or the fact that they're coupling together, so either separate or together. And based on that, it'll alert the patient or alert the physician to contact the patient to have them come in. And then through the discussion with the patient, they could decide what to do then. So it would be individualized to the patient and what's happening. Yes? How did it all start? How did it all start? <laughs> Um, it all started uh, with, um, I'm a biomechanist, so I mainly was interested in functional outcomes in patients with COPD. So I originally started looking at gait mechanics in patients with COPD and balance and falls. Um, but I, I read a lot, and I've always been really interested in synchronization of biological rhythms. And one day I started thinking about it because I wasn't really finding a lot different with gait mechanics in patients with COPD, and it was sort of a dead end. And I started playing with this idea, and one day I started talking to Dr. Renard about it, and it ended up with this huge conversation, and here we are. <laughs> there is. So breathing, heart rate, and locomotion are all entrained, the three entrained together. Um, there hasn't been a ton of research done on how the three work together. There's a group out of Japan that, have done, that has done a little work with the three, but heart rate and 
and respiration do in train as well. So um, using heart rate um, instead of breathing is a solution that we've uh, thought of um, and we're looking into as possibly an easier and less of a burden for the patient than monitoring respiration. Um, currently, the way that we're looking at monitoring respiration is uh, through the same material when you wear gloves to use your smartphone. Um, it's got a special kind of material in there that allows the electricity essentially from your hand to pass through the material. And so we've been using that same material to sort of measure respiration. Um, so we are, it's becoming somewhat cumbersome and the physicians actually aren't quite happy that we still have a strap that, that we're going to ask the patients to wear. Um, they'd like it to be even simpler. The problem with smartwatches and things like that is there's a lot of proprietary information so getting the data out that we want and using it in the way we want is a little difficult. Possibly heart rate may. Um, uh, the only problem is, is that the data don't suggest currently that heart rate um, is related or is predictive of an exacerbation, whereas respiratory rate is. Yeah, it's very, very true. All right, thank you.